following the early Japanese victories and their rapid advance throughout Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands during the beginning of 1942. By the end of 1942, the Allies had achieved a number of important victories, stopping the Japanese advance. In early May, at the Battle of the Coral Sea, the Japanese Port Moresby invasion force was turned back to Rabul, and this was followed by victory at Midway in early June. Then, between late August and early September, the Japanese suffered their first land defeat of the war when an Australian and American force repelled the landings at Milne Bay in New Guinea. The Japanese had also had setbacks at Kokoda between August and September, and by November 1941 had been pushed back to Buna and Ghana. By mid-December, Buna and Ghana fell to Australian and American troops fighting in horrific conditions. Additionally, after six months of intense fighting, the Japanese had decided to evacuate all remaining forces from Guadalcanal between January and February 1943. However, the Allies were far from in control. Japan, still believing that they could claim New Guinea, in December 1942 began plans to reinforce troops in New Guinea, particularly at Weewalk, Madang and Leib. In early January 1943, Japan launched a convoy of five transports and five destroyers from Rabaul, destined for Leh. Even though harassed by Allied aircraft throughout its journey, only two transports were lost and 4,000 troops made it to Leh, a success for the Japanese. The success of the January convoy gave the Japanese confidence and in February plans were drawn up for a much greater sized convoy to reinforce forces in New Guinea. Known as Operation 81, the convoy would consist of eight transports and eight destroyers, carrying five battalions of the 51st Infantry Division, comprising of 6,000 soldiers, 1,000 men of the 5th Special Landing Force, 1,500 non-combatant personnel, and much-needed supplies and weapons, including over 8,000 cubic metres of various fuels, including aviation fuel, 500 cubic metres of ammunition, 23 trucks, 34 motorized landing barges, two field guns, and three 100mm cannon. 100 fighters from both the Navy and the Army would provide air cover. By late February, the convoy had assembled in Simpson Harbour Rabaul and set to depart on February 28. However, the plans for the Japanese convoy had not gone undetected by the Allies. In early 1943, one wireless unit based in Townsville, Queensland had started to pick up on an increase in Japanese military traffic. On the 16th of February, the Fleet Radio Unit Melbourne, as well as codebreakers in Washington, completed decoding and decrypting a message that revealed the Japanese plans to reinforce troops in New Guinea, thus giving Allied commanders a clear idea of the Japanese intentions. Additionally, when combined with reconnaissance missions over Rabul in early February, the Allies were well alerted to the building of the convoy. The commander of the Allied Air Forces in the Southwest Pacific area, Lieutenant General George C. Kenney, United States Army Air Force, believed that Allied aircraft could stop the convoy, with planning and preparation quickly undertaken. However, it was Group Captain William Bull Gehring of the Royal Australian Air Force who convinced Kenny that an all-out assault would be the best method to stop in the convoy and proposed an extremely precise and coordinated attack from various altitudes as a way to achieve the results envisaged. The aircraft to be utilised in the attack would have come from both American and Australian squadrons. They all would be under the command of Brigadier General Enos Whitehead, United States Army Air Force, Deputy Kenny and Commander of the 5th Air Force's Advanced Echelon in New Guinea. Royal Australian Air Force aircraft came from No. 9 Operational Group at the time of the battle under the command of Air Commodore Joe Hewitt. In late February, a rehearsal upon the insistence of Gehring was undertaken. It was imperative for the attack to be a success that everything was done precisely. The aircraft would form up at the rendezvous point of Cape Rodney, 140 kilometers southeast of Port Moresby, before undertaking a simulated attack on the SS Pruth, an abandoned ship in Port Moresby Harbour. The rehearsal was somewhat a disaster, with aircraft showing up at different times, while some not showing up at all. Accuracy was also problematic. In the days following, debriefs and training exercises occurred in an attempt to fix and iron out the problems encountered. The Japanese convoy Operation 81 left Simpson Harbour Rabaul on the night of the 28th of February 1943. The convoy's route would take them west from Rabaul along the north coast of New Britain and through the Bismarck Sea before turning south to travel through 
the Vichia Strait and then into the Solomon Sea. The convoy would then turn west and head straight for Ley. Bare weather helped protect the Japanese convoy initially, however on the 1st of March, in the late afternoon, approximately 100 miles west of Rabaul, a B-24 Liberator spotted the convoy and a message was relayed straight back to headquarters. Consequently, during that night at roughly 10pm, eight B-17 Flying Fortresses were sent out to try and find the convoy, but failed to locate it. At dawn on the 2nd of March, six RAAF A-20 Bostons of number 22 Squadron took off from Port Moresby, tasked with the bombing and strafing the airfield at Ley to try and reduce air cover over the convoy. The convoy, after a few unsuccessful sorties, was finally located just after 8 o'clock by another B-24 Liberator. This resulted in a flight of eight B-17 bombers being sent out to attack, followed an hour later by 20 more B-17s. In the afternoon, raids were conducted by B-17s and B-24s. By day's end, it was reported that ships were, quote, burning and exploding, end quote, although only one ship was sunk, which was a transport. And although others were claimed to be hit, it seems little damage was done. Survivors from the transport that was sunk were picked up by two destroyers who raced ahead to Lee, dropping them off before returning to the convoy before daybreak the next day. By the end of the 2nd of March, the convoy had entered the Vichy Strait and thus now came into range of the entire Allied Air Force. Throughout the night of March 2nd, 3rd, a single RAAF Catalina flying boat from No. 11 Squadron based at Cairns, Australia, patrolled the convoy, keeping tabs on their movement. They also dropped four 250-pound bombs, but none hit their mark. As the Catalina turned for home just before dawn, the first strike mission of March 3rd was being sent out to attack the convoy, composed of Bofords of No. 100 Squadron, based at Milne Bay. Equipped with torpedoes, only two Bofords due to mixed weather were able to find the convoy, but no hits were recorded. However, this mission was significant as it gave the Allies an exact position on where the convoy were located, surprisingly much further away from Ley than expected. This was due to a decision by the convoy's commander, Rear Admiral Masatomi Kimura, to circle in the dark for two hours, which Michael Veach, in his book The Battle of the Bismarck Sea, concludes was, quote, one of the most catastrophic blunders of the entire Pacific War, end quote. Precious time in the cover of darkness had been wasted. Had this time not been wasted, it is possible the Japanese would have made it to lay. The Beaufort mission also reported very favourable weather with no clouds. The stage was set for the Allied attack. During the morning of the 3rd of March, RAAF Bostons once again attacked the airfield at Ley in another attempt to try and suppress air cover over the convoy. During the morning of the 3rd of March, Australian and American aircraft from bases right across New Guinea and northeast Australia took off their target to sink the convoy. In total, 16 Allied squadrons would be involved in the battle. The aircraft of the Allied Air Force formed at the rendezvous point of Cape Ward Hunt at 9.30am and by 10 o'clock the battle had begun. Three waves of Allied aircraft, seconds apart from each other, attacked the convoy from altitudes ranging from mere feet off the ground to 10,000 feet. The convoy was spotted just as they rounded the Huon Peninsula. As they turned west into the final stretch delay, they were not far over 100 miles from the destination. The battle commenced with the first wave, 13 B-17s dropping their bombs from about 7,000 feet onto the convoy. More than anything, these bombs were aimed at trying to break the convoy up from its defensive formation, thus making individual ships more vulnerable to the aircraft at low altitudes. This was quickly followed by B-25 bombers from various altitudes, ranging from 3,000 to 6,000 feet with 500-pound bombs. The B-17s and B-25s were successful in breaking the convoy up. As the bombs of the first wave were exploding, 13 RAAF bow fighters, the number 30 squadron, flew in to commence the second wave. Their objective, to suppress anti-aircraft fire and to take out the bridges. The bow fighters approached at only 500 feet in line stern formation before diving down to mass level altitude, mere feet off the water, changing their formation to line abreast. The Japanese would now make another costly mistake. It seemed that either they believed the bow fighters were going to make a torpedo attack or mistook the bow fighters as bow fed torpedo bombers, and so to present a smaller profile and make it harder for the bow fighters to hit them, 
the convoy turned and changed course to meet the bow fighters head on. However, the bow fighters were not making a torpedo attack, instead they were making a strafing attack and this gave the Australians a perfect target. Opening up their 6 303s and 420mm cannons, the bow fighters ripped into the convoy. Following the bow fighters in the final wave were 13 B-25 bombers bombing from medium level and 12 B-25 C-1 commerce destroyers specially modified B-25 for its drafting duties. Their objective was to sink the ships. The B-25 C-1s flying at mass level height continued what the bow fighters had started, strafing the ships with devastating firepower. The B-25 C-1s also carried 500 pound bombs, which by using the new technique of skip bombing, whereby the bombs bounce along the water to their target, managed to score 17 direct hits. Finally, A-20 Havocs of the United States Army Air Force joined the fight and with the bow fighters and B-25 C-1s made continued attacks over the convoy until the armament was spent. Higher up, the P-38 Lightnings combated with the Zeros protecting the convoy. Three Lightnings were shot down but the US pilots claimed 20 Zeros. The only other Allied aircraft to be lost in the battle was a B-17 shot down by a Zero. By the time the Allied Armada turned for home, the convoy was well and truly ablaze, and all but one ship being hit. The Allies returned in the afternoon, but due to bare weather over the Owen Stanley Ranges, the attack was smaller than planned. Still, B-17s, B-25s and RAAF Bostons managed to account for another 20 direct hits. By the end of the day, all eight transports had either been sunk or were sinking, as were three of the eight destroyers. A fourth destroyer, while floating, was significantly damaged. Flying on board one of the bow fighters of No. 30 Squadron was famous Australian combat photographer Damien Perra, who was able to film the battle. During the night of the 3rd, 4th of March, patrol torpedo boats were sent out. In the days following the battle, Allied aircraft and patrol torpedo boats patrolled the Huon Peninsula looking for and strafing vessels that had picked up survivors from the convoy. This was work, in the words of the Australian historian Alan Stevens, quote, fan nauseating, but as one RAAF bow fighter pilot said, every enemy they prevented from getting ashore was one less for their army colleagues to face, end quote. In the aftermath of the battle, controversy clouded the true extent of what had occurred. General MacArthur proclaimed in communiques that 22 ships had been destroyed and some 15,000 soldiers and sailors killed in the confrontation resulting in arguments erupting around the exaggerated claims. Secondly, the reports from both Kenny and MacArthur to Washington completely ignored and neglected the contribution by the RAAF, which no doubt was significant to the battle. The battle was a major victory for the Allies and a major point in the New Guinea campaign. While casualty numbers are unknown, at least 3,000 Japanese soldiers were killed. 2,700 were returned to Rabaul and only 1,200 made it to Lai. It shattered the Japanese confidence in sending even strongly escorted convoys to New Guinea, instead being forced to rely on small ships, barges and even submarines to deliver the supplies. This meant that reinforcements and supplies could never be delivered in enough quantity to ever properly support the forces there, let alone mount an offensive. The Japanese plan to capture New Guinea was crushed and opened the way for the Allies' assault forward through New Guinea. Some historians have gone as far as liking it to the midway of the New Guinea campaign. Indeed, this battle proved to be a decisive blow and the final of a series of victories that turned the tide of the New Guinea campaign. General Douglas MacArthur proclaimed that it was, quote, the decisive aerial engagement of the war in the Southwest Pacific, end quote. While historian Lex McCauley concluded that the battle was, quote, 30 minutes to change the balance of power in New Guinea, end quote. Indeed, the Battle of the Bismarck Sea was a decisive and significant victory for the Allies and a fatal blow for the Japanese.